Welcome to the Drama Dialogues, Life and Relationships Unraveled. I'm Jenny and I'm here to empower you on an exhilarating journey. Together we'll navigate the twists and turns of everyday dramas with practical tips and engaging stories so you can have a powerful day every day. Get ready to embrace healthier relationships, effective communication and personal growth. Join me as we unravel the mysteries of life's dramas and share a few laughs along the way. Get ready to ditch the chaos and embrace the magic. This is the Drama Dialogues. Hi everyone. Today, this is the very first time I have recorded um, a visual of my podcast. So we'll see how it goes. But uh, I know that Luke is on lots of videos. He's all over the place visually. So I thought it would be a good place to start for having an actual um, visual recording as well as just the audio. So today my guest is Luke and he is known as the muscle coach. Um, He's doing other stuff as well. So we're going to go into that a bit more. But uh, today we're going to talk about fatherhood because he just became a dad a, a one month ago. It's exactly a month ago, isn't it, Luke? Yes, it was a month yesterday. So exciting. And the whole world turns upside down. And I think um, dads don't actually get to talk about their experience of becoming a father very often. I think it's another thing that isn't really talked about. And so I really wanted Luke to come on and talk about his experience and the things that are going on now. We've just had a great conversation um, off record and I said, hold on to that. That's great. So we're going to have that conversation again um, where we're talking about goals and how, how goals can change and life can change when we bring new people into this crazy world. So, Luke, tell us a little bit about yourself first. Well, I really do appreciate Jenny bringing us onto the podcast. I know we've obviously kind of been brought together through a mutual connection, uh, Simon, which obviously I think uh, we have to give him a little bit of a shout out here because this wouldn't be happening otherwise. Um, And it looks like Simon's going to be having twins. Well, this is, I was actually going to say, we was thinking he's quite busy at the moment. And then he came out Saturday for my belated 30th celebrations and, he just went, Luke, I've got something to tell you, but don't say anything because we're going to say, you know, we're going to put it out to the world on Tuesday. And he just said, we twins. I was like, no way. Crazy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they just obviously on the topic of what we're talking about today, um, I think just just about myself in general, um, I mean, I could always ask the question, how long you got? But I don't want to go into too, too We've got much. an hour, Luke. We've <laughs> got an hour, right. Okay, that could just be enough time um so for me uh, I think if we go back to my childhood I was always very active I would go as far as hyperactive I just had an abundance of energy I was an outgoing person I was that kid go out come home when it's dark that's what my dad used to say to me just make sure you're back home when it's dark that was it I was on my bike I was footballing and then I don't know he always kind of instilled that fun element in my life he always wanted me to do various sports so anyway with that I fell in love with football. David Beckham, recent uh, documentary on Netflix, which everyone's really talking about. Yeah, uh, have you w- seen it? Yes. Have you? Awesome, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not a football fan. I'm not a Beckham fan, but I thought it was yeah. very good. I really found it interesting. Yeah, no, I I agree. I think um, these things there that, again, what I had to hold on to for years and how he had to hold a certain identity and be strong and mentally strong and be able to go in front of those fans, I think was just immense. But he was somebody that that era of the, I don't know when they call it, like the, the golden years of United, glory years, glory, glory, man United. I was a, a diehard United fan at that time and I just love football. And my, my brother was a United fan, so it was very much in my household. Um, <laughs> it was all around me, so I didn't escape it, even though it wasn't my thing. So yes, um, Man United was very much in my life from birth. Yeah, well, there, there you go. What, what a team! I mean, I can't really say they're doing so well at the minute, but um, yeah, I just, I just pretty much was obsessed, and I wouldn't go as far as as obsession when I was hearing about uh, obviously David Beckham's father. I know he took him out a lot and practiced and practiced, but my dad was there for me. You know, he he really kind of worked his life of work around uh, my commitments, and then he kind of put me into professional academies at the age of thirteen, fourteen, and then. Um, I signed like a, a what is a scholarship and then I did full time football. So I didn't necessarily do the college, the sixth form, the university route. I just did football. That was it. I was like, I want to be a professional footballer. It's all I've ever known. It's all I ever want to be. 
Um, and, you know, you kind of had that stigma around people at schools, like, you're going to make it, remember when you're famous and all this kind of stuff. And obviously I, I did feel that pressure on my shoulders as well. I mean, you can say that it's not pressure, but when you actually think about it, it is, it is a lot to kind of live up to. And then when it when I got to the age of 19, I just kind of fell out of football, um, got released, didn't get a professional contract. And it just left me with, I suppose, a lot of people who are listening to this, if if they've been in a professional sport or, you know, have done a lot of full-time training or army, anything where, you know, there's such a big commitment to it. And then it just gets stripped away from you, like within a day. Um, yeah, it just left me lost. I fell into a bit of a rut. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I did, God, I traveled to Madrid. I lived in Madrid for a little bit. I just did a lot of traveling to try different cultures of football and sport because, you know, Spanish football was all like tick attacker at the time. You know, doesn't doesn't matter about your size because in, I don't know what it was in England at the time, they wanted you to be six foot plus, like a massive unit. And obviously I'm five foot seven. So I felt that rejection. Um, so then that's that... interesting about that though I always think of footballers as being really small well probably yeah, is na- yeah probably is now I mean, isn't it a perception that you get where I remember my think thought of footballers all the boys at football uh, that played football at school were always really small and compact yeah well there you go well that's <laughs> it's interesting you say that I mean i don't know what it was. Maybe the old school or the older generation mentality of just big bruisers. And 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 obviously now football, I suppose, is transitioned to a lot more athletics. You know, you're a bit more, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter so much about your size. It's about your technical ability and your sharpness and your focus. Yeah, it, I think for me at that period, I just struggled. I struggled with rejection. Um, I fell into depression. And that's when then it affected my performance. I didn't believe in myself. And then I started thinking, where can I go from here? And that's when I was working part-time with my dad engineering. You know, I got offered to come through the family business, as I'm sure a lot of people go through family businesses. Just, I hated it. I absolutely hated engineering. I'm not a hands-on person. If you want me to do any DIY, I'm really not the guy. Um, and, and I was just finding like, what am I good at? You know, it was that simple task where I sat there and was writing down on a piece of paper, what are my skills? Where do I thrive? I was really good at drama at school, got an A star. So I thought, okay, could maybe go into drama. Um, I got told I could be a TV presenter. I was like, how would I even go to media? And then, uh, but at the time I just loved the gym. That was my escape. That was my place where, you know, I could really let my guard down and be myself and not feel judged. You know, everybody in the gym was just there to kind of better themselves. So I did that and I thought, do you know what? I think I want to help people as well. You know, that helped me Um, through this period. I had many personal trainers and coaches. So I thought I understood the importance of having somebody there to be accountable to. So I went through my PT qualification and uh, then I basically got qualified, created muscle coach. So that's what came up with the name muscle coach results with care. That was it. And then I kind of put that one to bed and just left it to one side because I got offered to go on cruise ships. So I I then was like, right, I'm going to go and travel the world. Um, I did that for two and a half years, literally Australia, you know, you name it, New Zealand. I did things that I never thought I would do, you know, skydive, you know, in Hawaii, just, you know, surfing in, you know, all these things that you just think, oh, I'd love to do that. I was kind of like just ticking them off. It's, it's, it's funny, actually, because um, a lot of my clients work on cruise ships doing, really? um, ah. yeah, generally in like the theater world part of it. Mm. And Matt worked um, on cruise ships for for a while, doing all the lighting, setting up the lighting, building the theatre lighting within cruise ships. So he's also travelled all over the world doing that. And I think it's really a great experience for young people Mm. to go off and just do, as you say, the things that you never imagined that you could ever do. And And I do think that that's something our young people could sort of take some notice of is that there are industries out there and jobs that you can do such as PT yeah. that doesn't mean you have to be down your gym it means you can be traveling the world yes and and so I think that's a great message to put out there to all the young people because I know there's a lot of them sat at home now I've got yeah. my own going I don't know what to do I don't know what I'm good at I don't really even know what I enjoy <laughs> I just don't yeah. know what I want to do and um and knowing that actually you can maybe find something like the gym that feels like it's a one track route and go, actually, I can go on a cruise ship for three months and travel the world. Yeah, yeah, awesome. and, 
No, no, I, I know we've spoken, haven't we? Yeah, about Matt being in theatre performances and and hired a lot of respect for the for the guys on there, and they did that as well. Like even in the theatre world, you know, they all their dreams were to be on Broadway or the West End, and if they weren't going to cut the the position that they was going for or the acts that they was going for, they they would just result in going on cruise ships just to keep them ticking over or keep you know the skills, the singing. It wasn't a, like a dem- demotion in any way. If anything, it was a way of building up the confidence, keeping them going so then they can try again when they're back on land. And actually the pay, I think, is better on the cruise ships and it's yeah, better terms yeah. in a lot of ways, but it's not got the same kudos. So it, it's kind of the snobbery there within within that world of you're on the cruise ships because you haven't made it. But actually some of the best um, musicians are on the cruise ships because that's yeah. where they earn the money. Yeah, yeah, it was. No, I mean, it was one thing that, I mean, I hate to say this, but you shouldn't really compare about financial stuff, but they did have a great lifestyle and got paid well for it. But, you know, they're talented people. And I think when we was, you know, in the spa area on the cruise ship, we was around commission basis. So what that did is because I've I've never really been provided in my life with financial security ever. You know, I've never done the nine till five. I've never known on a monthly basis, what my actual income is going to be. So I had to learn to develop my skills in business. I had to learn to market myself. I had to build my confidence. To be honest, the whole cruise ship experience for me, and and I think kids, you know, if they're not going to want to go down the university route, doing something like that, I know a lot of people go backpacking, but I feel if you go into it, you, you, like you get paid, but the incentive is not necessarily, yes, you, you can get paid tax-free, so there you go, bonus on ships, but the incentive is time off. So the incentive is being able to explore and enjoy more of what the world has to offer. So for me, I really got good at sales. And that's what built me thinking, do you know what? I think I can really build up my own business here. And what I found as well is it was the energy of people and being around like-minded people. And I was thinking I had to work in teams. That's what it was. The spa was a team. I wasn't a solo one-man band. So I I understood the importance of that. And I think that's what got me to when I thought, you know what? I think my time's up on cruise ships. I'm 25. I wanted to have my own place. I got on the housing market at 25. I literally saved up my money when I come back home, started in a local gym, built up my PT business. And I had the confidence because I understood what people needed. I had great people skills that again, would come through experience of working with people on ships, throwing myself in the deep end. And I think then it really evolved from there. And I've I've always kind of said this that and and somebody asked me yesterday, Luke, what's what's like three things you wish you knew when you first started out in the fitness industry? And one of them was I just I wish they drilled into me more about community and being around great people because I think for me, you you'll know this, Jenny, as well, that I don't know, you know, when you just walk into a room, even if you're networking and stuff like that, and people are welcoming you in and they're like, hey, how are you? What do you do? What's your kind of line? And, and you sense that engagement and that feeling and people understand and listen to you. There's no there's no kind of better human connection than than ever with 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 those kind of people. Um, I think when you're just on your own, because I've I've felt lonely, you know, and even with where I'm at in business now being, I mean, people can list it as a solopreneur or you know, an entrepreneur or whatever it may be, it can be lonely. So yeah. I think it's just all about, yeah, that that bringing people together, I think is is something that's definitely helped me in, in my life. And then that's transitioned me now into more mastier life, which a lot of people are like, oh, what's this? You know, what's made that been, been a bit of like a, a branch to your tree from like muscle coaches, the core, um, but mastier life is a program that, it's more, I suppose, working with health and well-being in a workplace. It's working with people that are struggling with burnout. You know, they're the people that are probably tipping themselves over the edge and not finding that fun outside of work. So because they're not having fun outside of work, it's they're taking that into the workplace. And what what the consequences are is that they are putting themselves into a, a place of illness and sickness, and they're putting in sick notes to work. I mean, yeah. the, the the statistics in today's world of people putting in sick notes, how many days off they have a year is 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 creeping up higher and higher. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it is um, I think it's a real problem. And one of the things I was talking to Matt about this morning when we went for our walk was how I struggle now to fit 
I, I used to be doing like during the lockdown period and sort of after that, I was doing three gym classes a week, right. two other classes. I was walking an hour every day. And now I'm like, I don't know how I would even fit that into my day. Like I can't even rem- imagine what I was doing back then to enable that. But I was, I was doing something that was allowing that to happen. And it's, I think you can get so kind of focused in life and in work and in the kind of the shit of stuff that you forget that actually fitting in that hour walk is more important Mm. than some of the other stuff that you're doing. And it's about prioritizing. And for me, it's getting up earlier, which sometimes can be a drag, particularly in the winter and doing it earlier so that I can then start my day. Whereas if I think I'll do it later in the afternoon, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's having that recognition of if I leave it to later, I'm not just, I'm not just not going to do it. (laughs) Yeah. I, I can relate to that a million percent. And you were just telling me about your run this morning. Yeah, yeah. So just on, on what you said there about the morning thing, you know, I, I don't know whether you do this, but something that's worked really well for me, and especially, I suppose, working with coaches that are all about performance, you know, not about, you know, athletes, but just performance mentally and physically. They They talk about blocking it out in your diary, just how you would, you know, block out like this, a podcast, you know, a podcast meeting with somebody, you know, block out your date night i know that sounds weird but you know block it out block out a walk with your dog whatever it may be like put it in your calendar so it's there because otherwise you may let it slip your mind so for me i do that with training and this morning for example yesterday i was manifesting it i was like i'm gonna get some miles in the legs on wednesday morning wednesday morning is my run time and i was like, i'm gonna do 10 miles that's what i'm gonna do so last night i thought wow yeah you know Remy's asleep at half past nine. Me and Abby was like, should we just go to bed? Because she's just settled down. We know that we'll, she'll get generally three hours. Um, so Abby does the first feed. So literally, uh, Remy did wake up at like half past 11. She had a feed. So probably I got to sleep about half past 10. And then at half past three, she's making loads of noises. I get up, feed her. She's wide awake. You know, she can't sell. So I put her back down. There's just, I don't know. There's nothing you can do to even try and get her down. She's just wide awake. So you put the dummy in. She spits it out, you know, she's making all these noises. So practically I was like on and off until um, six and I woke up and I felt really, you know, you know, you know, when you're really tired and your eye sockets feel heavy, like not, it wasn't my head. It was just like your eyes just feel really heavy. That's what it was like for me this morning. And I actually tried to close my eyes again. I was thinking, I'll just, I need some more sleep. But then at 6.04, I was like, Luke, get yourself up out of bed. Now, another thing that I do is I actually put, because it's dark and Abby's still asleep, I put my clothes that I'm going to wear gym-wise right next to my bed. So as soon as I wake up, it's there. So I had my running vest, I had my headband, you know, you name it. The only thing I had to go was go in the other room and get my trainers and then go downstairs. And then in the morning, I always read. So I read for 30 minutes. So that was it. And then, you know, I sit there with black coffee and then I, I do some men's work. So there's what a men's... What did you read? Uh, it's the uh, Bonnie uh, Bronnie Ware this sounds really deep, uh, the top five regrets of the dying. <laughs> yeah, no, good. Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, to, to put it quite obviously bluntly, you know, it's, we don't really acknowledge or think we're going to die, do we? <laughs> we just kind of avoid the whole death thing because it's like, oh my gosh, you're so depressing. But really, it's quite interesting to hear this woman that's been caring for these people and what they say when they get towards their deathbed, like what they're regretting, like the biggest regret is not living a life true to themselves. Yeah. So, but anyway, that so that's what I'm reading. So that's quite insightful. And then I jump on a meeting at seven o'clock, Monday to Friday, every morning we do men's work. So we're talking about archetypes at the moment and stuff like that. So that's really good to just be in a men's group where it's a safe place to share. So really, really I'm kind of I'm kind of energized in the morning anyway. So that kind of sets me up. No social media devices, you know, I'm not, I'm just that's my time. So then I was like half past seven, got my gear on. And I start running and um, I'm running through trails, loads of dog walkers out. It's pretty windy. And I'm thinking, right, running against the wind, it's pretty tough. But body felt good. Mind was like good. I was looking at my watch and I was thinking, I'm creeping up to 10 miles here. Luke, you're 3.1 miles away from here from doing your first ever half marathon. Are you just going to like throw the towel? This is going through my mind. Are you just going to throw it in at 10 miles and just be like, I did 10 miles because that's what you said. Or actually, you're just going to push yourself and just get that first half marathon. I wasn't really fussed about time. I wasn't going, I need to get this, I need to get that. I was just like, but my legs feel good. My body feels good. My mind feels good. So anyway, I kept running and I was getting to the village and it was like 11 miles. And 
I was like, where can I run now? Because I can't go back on trails. I've been ran all the way up and down these trails. So I'm doing loops around village. And this old lady, she's like going, hey, uh, hello again, kind of thing. Like this guy's going around again. I just, I'm like, I've got to get 13.1 mile. I've got to get this half marathon. So I did it. I nailed it. I got well, it. My, my, you know, my legs were start. You know, I started feeling my legs start seizing up a little bit as you do. I think because my mind was like, I've done it. Um, and I did it in one hour, 48 minutes and 43 seconds. And I was, I was just really, yeah, really surprised. And I think, you know, if you think about, the the night, you know, the going back the day and how the night planned out, it would have been and plus plus it's dark morning, you know, it's pitch black in the morning. It would have been so so easy to just but what because I've not got no goal, you know, it's not like I've got a marathon coming up this year or anything like that. It it's so easy. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll put it off. But there you go. I didn't plan it, gone out, achieved it. It was me v me. And you just feel amazing, don't you? Awesome. So have you never ever run a half marathon? Never. It's amazing, actually, because oh, I I hate running. Like it is not my bag. Hate running, and um, <laughs> I just think every time I've tried to run, I've ended up on extreme inhalers. So I just oh. so I just don't run. Um, but I always thought that runners or people that run will just go, oh yeah, let's get the half marathon and the marathon done, so that I've done them. Um, I don't understand it, but it is, it is not my thing. I was talking to one of my other guests recently who used to do ultra marathons and she'd run like a hundred miles at a time. Wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, on, on that note, I have, I have actually booked and I did this on my 30th birthday. I thought I'm going to treat myself as you do. And I booked a 50 kilometer Peak District Ultra um, for next year. <laughs> it's a Ju- treat. Yeah, I know. Imagine. Uh, I just thought, I need something in my diary. I mean, we've got tough oh, mudder next year. Uh, I'm doing, I've, I've not booked it yet, but I'm, I'm doing a men's retreat as well. And I was thinking, I just, yeah, I just want to do something that's really out of my comfort zone. And because I've done all the, I suppose, in, in, in like personal training and all that kind of stuff, and obviously I've now transitioned to more like hybrid, a bit online, you know, doing more business stuff. Uh, it's very kind of like you do the photo shoots, you do the body transformations, you know, you, you like people will go, Oh, you know, you got to look good though. You know, people invest in you on the way you look. And yeah, obviously it, it's a pulling factor. I wouldn't say it's the absolute deal breaker, but generally speaking, I wouldn't particularly invest in somebody if I didn't look at them and think, well, they kind of know what they're doing. You know, they look well, they look after themselves because they've got good standards yeah. And so I did, I did the extreme though. You know, I was doing the, like, get yourself really shredded do your photo shoots and yeah i i just thought i'm done with that now i'm 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 becoming a dad you know i want i want to settle down a little bit i don't want to be there you know seeing a toddler you know seeing remy kind of grow up and i'm there with like a a plastic container weighing out my food to the gram you know that brings us beautifully on to being a dad um how did you feel when you first heard you were going to be a dad so this sounds really bad, and I don't know whether any dads can relate to this, but it just, it just didn't process. Yeah. So I I didn't believe it. Well, I, I did, but I did. it didn't come across as I believed it because Abby would always say to me, you don't believe I'm pregnant, do you? It's interesting. You're not the first person I've heard that from. I know people that it took till the baby was three months old before they finally went, Oh, oh, my dad. Wow. So I think, and this is why I wanted to talk about this with you today, because I know you are open and honest. Mm-hmm. And I think that dads are really, it's a tough time for them. But of course, because it's the mum carrying the baby <laughs> and doing all that sort of stuff, the dads aren't really supposed to have emotions and feelings. They're not supposed to say, I didn't feel like I was going to be a dad. Like all of that stuff is actually not almost allowed in a man's world and that's why I think it's a really important topic for us to talk about and why I'm really grateful that you were super honest about that because I think when you say I don't know if anybody can relate to this I know lots and lots of men will relate to that Mm. but don't feel they can say it out loud yeah yeah I I think I I mean I I felt this mindset and I I don't know whether it's this this could be a reason why guys do tend to I suppose we're good at bottling things up aren't we you know we don't we don't openly communicate and I I will say this is something that I would suggest to every man um, that are thinking about starting a family or 
going to have another one, whatever it may be, is communicate clearly with your partner at all times, how you feel emotionally, you know, anything, anything that's bothering you. Just literally the your best friend, like you talk to your best friend, like you tell them everything. Like, I've got something to tell you. It's a secret. Oh my God, I forgot to tell you this. That That's literally how me and Abby operate because if we don't, it becomes a disconnect and we, we do we do have little tips here and there. So I think I started feeling the pressure financially. That was the other thing because straight away, I don't know whether it comes through generations or as a guy, you feel the provider, you know? So for me, all right, I didn't, I, again, because Abby wasn't necessarily like showing a bump or, you know, face was swelling at this, you know, first probably I would probably go anyway. Between, like, I would go 16, 20 weeks, start probably that period, see like, okay, she's looking a bit more pregnant. <laughs> um, and we was going through a house move as well at the same time. So that was all up in the air. We had buyers pull out. Obviously, the housing market weren't great at the time. We also didn't have our mortgage through. Yes, we had a mortgage in principle, but because we're both self-employed, there was a, a risk that we wouldn't have got it. So there was all that that was playing on my mind. And because, obviously, I have been accustomed to burnout in the past, I have done the 1900-hour weeks. I've got up at quarter past four in the morning and worked till 10 o'clock. I've been silly, you know. Well, not been silly. People could say, well, you need to do that to build a business. You don't really, but I did it just because I I was, I loved it. You know, I love, love working. So yes. there was that mindset of like, I don't want to go back there. I, I do not want to get into work because working more time and working harder and thinking that that's not necessarily going to make you feel more financially secure or it's not, you know, or even, or even it's not going to help you show up better, is it? You know, you're not going to be good to be around. Your energy is going to be tanked because you, you're stressed all the time. And I, and I shared this on social media as well. I said to people, I'm struggling, you know, I'm struggling mentally because I'm, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go because I'm like, all right, I'm having a baby, but then I'm moving house. And, you know, I, I was the person on the house and oh, we, we lost loads of equity on it. You know, we had to sell it off on an auction. I mean, of all things. And then I was thinking going over to this new house uh, and we fought it. Although, I mean, it all obviously it's all kind of come together. And, I, and, I, and I'm not trying to put a dampener on this conversation because... Not honestly, at all, it's reality. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You had your vision and you had your goal and you got there, but you got there via a lot of wiggles in the road, which is what happens in life. Yeah. Oh, there was... There was uh, there was a lot of wiggles and it was all out of our control. You know, that's the other thing as well. Yeah. I, I'm quite, you know, I like to control the controllables, as you'd say, in, in the world of, you know, personal development. And there is yeah. things you can't control. Yeah. And I think as well, it was the other thing, you know, we, we started, um, you know, watching baby stuff. I mean, I, I didn't really start watching this. Uh, is it a newborn every, every minute? minute? Yeah, that's it. One born <laughs> every minute. Yeah. Probably, terrified the life out of yourself yeah yeah seeing guys pass out went, you're not gonna pass out next to me are you? and i was like uh <laughs> no i don't think so she went yeah but i do know and I went, well i don't know but i think i'm all right um so as you know we started watching that in the last probably yeah six weeks because before obviously she arrived um but yeah it was like it was like all i was thinking about jenny and this sounds really bad really is i was just thinking i want to get in the house i just want to get in the house so I want to get in the house. I want to make sure that I can afford to keep a roof over our head for, for us. Um, and because Abby was slowing down with work, you know, she was letting clients know, you know. It, it yeah, was and of, you was... work together too. Yeah. So that's another pressure. Well, yeah, yeah. So so it was like, I mean, obviously she did get a bit of paternity pay as well, which was a little bit of a comfort blanket in a way. Not amazing, but um, that was that. So, yeah, I think as guys, we, we, we just kind of crack on. We're in that mentality of I might, pick up a bit of overtime or I might work a bit harder because obviously I, I need the money, you know, and I think, but you don't, we don't talk enough uh, with our partners throughout the process on how we feel. But I also, I, I have said to Abby as well, and I, I, I've not had an argument with her, but I went, do you know what I'd really appreciate? I'd really appreciate if you asked me how I was, you know, like I, I have said that I've called her out on that. I've challenged her. I've not been a, a dick about it. I've just gone, you know, I know I'm asking you and I understand you're carrying a human being and I know it's a lot for you and I know your back's hurting and I know you've got hormonal, but you know, I'm here busting my ass off. I'm, I'm showing up for us. Like, I, I, 
reciprocation going on, you know? And she then felt that. It's it's really hard and it's a brilliant point because I do think we're in a society where at the moment everybody is talks about the patriarchy and how men have been suppressing women for centuries and, and all of that stuff. And in all of that, we are actually forgetting that there are some amazing men out there that just need asking how they are. Mm. And that not all men are dicks. In fact, most men aren't. There are a fair group that are, but most men aren't actually. Most men are trying to get the right thing together for their partners, for their families. And in in those moments, we do need to step back as women and say, actually, thank you. Or how are you feeling? Because we don't. And I did the same. I had antenatal depression. So I cried all the way through my pregnancy it was really stressful. I had postnatal depression. So I, I was a zombie for months. And I know that my ex-husband really struggled, but because it was all on me and, and the focus was on me because I was so ill, he must have felt, well, I know he did anyway. He must have felt terrible mm. and always looked pale, always looked ill. And I think for men, there isn't that same level of And it's great that you can have that conversation. And this is the sort of conversation that I have with Matt is we'll go, hold on a minute. What do we need for each other? Like, what do we both need? And we have that check-in. So I love the fact that you sort of said that instead, because lots of men don't say it to their partners because they'll just go down the pub or they'll go to their mates and they'll Mm. bitch and moan and they will never pass it on because either they don't feel they can or they feel like they don't want to put the extra pressure on or they don't know how to do it or they just think their wife's being a pain. Um, Whereas you know that that's not the case. You know, it's just sometimes as women, we don't have foresight for everything. We can't do everything. We can't think everything all the time. And we can't think to ask, how are you? So I think that's great that you you asked her for that. No, I I appreciate it. I mean, just just even on the topic that I know you're going to be talking about um, at our conference um, in January, which is the difficult conversations, you know, the, the conflict, the stepping up to to have an open um kind of conversation i think that's going to be um well i mean i know it's going to be absolutely golden value for i'm very excited about doing it yeah power questions i think we're very afraid of to ask questions and to ask people for things for ourselves and when we don't that's actually when the problems start that's when miscommunication happens is when we don't ask the questions and we don't ask for what we want and instead we kind of mind read and we sit there thinking, well, Abby should be saying, how are you? And and, yeah. and if you hadn't had that conversation, the resentment builds and builds and builds mm-hmm. and that's when you explode or, you know, so I think um, that's amazing. Um, how did you find when you got through the pregnancy and you came to terms with it, how did you find the whole birthing process? Well, we, we had a brief chat about this and I'd, I have to say thank you for dropping me just a voice note off the side and asking how I was and the whole experience because, you know, you well, putting it out that you was the only person off the side that asked me how I was. I, actually, the midwife did as well, to be fair. She just went, oh, Luke, because um, when she come around, they do a lot of visits, don't they, just after the, you know, baby's born and stuff. She actually asked me how I was, you know, because the men don't get asked how they are and they obviously go through a bit of a, a traumatic experience as well. Um, so... Abby had emergency C-section. It wasn't planned. She had it in her mind that she was going to have a water birth. You know, that that was the the plan. You know, I mean, all these birth plans, I don't I don't even know why they do them, but anyway, so you know, so so we that that was the plan. And um basically she she started bleeding. And this was early hours of Tuesday morning. She kind of woke me up. I was just a bit dazed, like, what's going on? She was like, Luke, I've called up the hospital. This they want to come and check me. So um we've got to go. By this period anyway, we'd already packed our bags, you know, in advance as you do, just in case we have to stay in. Got there, she were already three centimeters dilated and that's it. We were staying in. And they said, You're going to give birth today. Now because she had already I don't know the term for it, um, but Apparently, her waters had broke already, um, so she was at risk of infection. So she had to have the hormone drip, which then stopped her from having a water birth. So it was like, you can't have a water birth. So Abby was like, oh, okay. So what, you know, it'd just be all these like pain meds or whatever. Could have epidural, all that kind of stuff. Um, but you just, yeah, you can have gas in here, whatever you want. 
Um, but they just said, once you have the hormone drip, you can't eat. So she had some toast, had some coffee. And then literally from probably, I would say uh, about 4 a.m., about half past four in the morning, something like that. That's when really it was just, she had all them things attached to her, them two things that around with straps around her. And it was hearing all the beats and, you know, seeing all these graphs, which were, I think for me, it was just, I felt such a, passenger in all of it like as in obviously i was just stood there going you okay you know is there anything i can do and and guys will relate to this it's a little bit like you just want to comfort them and yeah and obviously seeing her in pain weren't nice and then she'd done all this kind of work and i was massaging her back got these essential oils and i went she was sat forward on the ball bouncing because that was the best position like leaning forward and she was just she was she couldn't communicate really. She had a time on. She was doing the contractions. You know, she was breathing the gas and air in tune with that, and uh, she was just in agony. You know, it was it was like she, she just said, "I mean, what's going on?" And this um, midwife was like, "You can do this. You can do that. You can have this pain." It was just all it was just all pain meds. And um, I'm I'm yeah. I mean, I understand there's a time and place, but I'm a bit against just like absolutely ingesting all of that stuff because obviously the after effects. And side effects can just be, well, well, it did. It did do it to Abby anyway after she just had ridiculous diarrhea and, oh, it was ter- loads of blood loss. And anyway, long, long story on that. But it was horrible to see. It was just seeing her in so much pain. And obviously she was exhausted. She'd not eaten for 20 hours or something like that. And obviously for me, I'd not eaten at this point. I was just by the bedside. And then it got to the point where she did, um, she started pushing. So they came in, the midwife's like, right, you can push. Because she could see that, you know, everything, she was, she was 10 centimeters dilated, she was ready to go. She started pushing and the heart rate dropped on on Remy. You know, it just dropped. So the the, the uh, midwife went, Luke, can you just press, uh, press the emergency lever or pull it? So I pulled it, 20 people came in. You know, everybody pushed me to one side. Abby was like, where's Luke? Where's Luke? You know, she was properly zoned out with all the gas and air that she'd taken on. She had epidural as well. And um, yeah, basically this doctor surgeon came and said, look, 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 look. Um, this is what's happening. Basically a skin in a cervix. There's like a layer of skin. Remy's head were pushing against it. So as, every time Abby were pushing, her head was swelling and it was, she, she just didn't want to come out basically. Um, so then anyway, she tried again, pushed again. It wasn't working. And then they just went, look, you've been here over 22 hours, pushing and pushing and pushing. Let's get you in. Let's just get you in the theater. And, um, yeah, that was it really. It was just going to the theater. Obviously I uh, sat there by the side. I, I poked my head around to see what was going on. I wish I never did. Um, cause they ripped a womb out, you know, they were pulling it out completely. And I was like, Holy God. Oh, wow. Um, and then, and then literally I was, uh, they put, I, I seen a, you know, pull Remy out and sort of umbilical cord. Cause I got to cut the umbilical cord. I was like, yes, I've done something. Um, and then I, I went around to the side and, you know, you could see her there. She's purple, but she's just gasping for air. You know, she's not making no noise. And obviously they always cry, don't they, when they come out and stuff like that. Um, and so they was just putting oxygen into her to, to help her cry. And I said, Abby, she's there. She's there. She's beautiful. And all this. She, and Abby's like, I can't, I can't see her. I can't see her. So I like, pulled her pillar down so she could look to the side. And then Abby just burst into tears because she was like, she's not crying. She's not crying. Why is she not crying? And I'm like, babe, she's getting, just getting oxygen into her. Just give her a bit of time. Get Relax, relax, relax. And then she could feel the stitches because they were stitching her up. She could feel the pain of the stitches. And she was like, Luke, I'm in so much pain. And then the guy was like, are you feeling any pain? She's like, yes, I can feel pain. And this guy was then just putting in whatever he was doing, like more pain medication or something. And then, yeah, she started crying. And obviously we was just both exhausted. We'd had no sleep. Um, Abby had obviously had no food. And then, yeah, basically she went into the ward and she had to have a lot more blood tests because of the risk of infection because the waters broke, not with her, but also uh, with Remy as well. So then Remy had to go and have this like cannula on her hand and she had to have blood work, you know. Then we had to stay in for a couple of nights. So I practically had to do kind of all the work, um, you know, like nappy change feeding just because, Abby was just completely exhausted, you know. Um, obviously, she had some cuddles with her and stuff, and then her mum and dad came. But, yeah, all in all, it was it was really, really, you know, physically traumatic for Abby, you know. I mean, she, she didn't anticipate an emergency C-section. She wanted natural, you know. She thought that that was full focus. And then I think 
yeah, it hit her. I mean, they say after day three, don't they? The female, um, is it progesterone or something? Or is it the elevated mm. hormone that's really high? I can't remember what it is. Um, she just cried loads. Them. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, they, they just said day three is where it kind of really, you know, you're emotional. And that's when we came home. And because obviously Abby was struggling to, you know, walk and stuff, she had a lot of pain. She, obviously she had, she had like a whole bag of medication to take home with her. Again, I had to do a lot of the stuff, the cooking and whatever, you know. I, I You know, we both completely did our baby bubble. So as in I had a week off work, completely Abby was taking two off anyway. She, we, we'd done all the planning with clients anyway. But um, yeah, she just broke into tears. And again, I think because I know Abby's independent and then obviously she couldn't drive um for a period of time with the c-section she can't train yeah it just it was hard to swallow for me to see that but at the same time you know I wanted to make sure that I was there for as much as I could really it is a really hard um situation I mean everything you've described there is like a combination of my two deliveries (laughs) my first one was a cesarean but it wasn't an emergency it was but it wasn't so I had no labor um it was a case of have a scan see that she's breached there's no fluid there we're going to have a cesarean the next day but I really struggled with it like the whole process as you say when she comes out and you're like what's going on I can't see or I don't I didn't know what was going on there was a lack of communication yeah um so my that whole process was difficult and then my second one I had a natural delivery but again like you her head kept pushing and she was stuck for ages and they were just about to um well the surgeon just put his head the consultant put his head around the door to see if we needed another cesarean and that that was the point she came out and I did the whole thing on um a few hours of gas and air and then basically nothing because I couldn't stand the gas and air so I had no pain relief at all and then I had to have surgery for an hour and a half after I delivered her with no pain relief and um so I'm in this surgery I was like what (laughs) surgery having a spinal and all the stuff and I'm chatting away to the surgeon and he's it's like three o'clock in the morning he's probably thinking will this woman shut up because I was like (laughs) totally like oh adrenaline and and I came out and we were in the ward and and my um ex-husband was just fast asleep on the foot of my bed and the midwife looked over and just kind of giggled because I'm there totally wired and he's absolutely exhausted because literally been up all night Mm -hmm. and you know the first time there was I don't think him and my mum were both were there both times but I don't think um I don't think either of them even went to the toilet and we were there for all night I don't remember either of them leaving they might have done but I don't think they did and it's just that physical like I know he was really bruised from me like from holding me and looking like physically he felt really difficult and bruised my Mm. mum was exhausted and I think um the birthing partners whoever they are just don't get enough credit actually (laughs) it's a lot of work isn't it yeah honestly I think more obviously it's mentally isn't it you're just trying to stay focused you want to be present I think that's the biggest thing as well you want to be remembering that I also love um, I talk about this a lot, but I love that kind of age old adage of, oh, I'm not going near the business end. And then um, yeah. my husband said to me, he's like, it's really weird because the business end is li- is like there. It's not there. It's not in another room. It's not 15 foot away. It's literally like there's only two foot between you and the business yeah. end. But it's actually there. You can't. So this whole thing of I'm not going down the business end, he found hilarious because actually you can't really avoid it unless you've got the screen up like you say you know unless there's a a screen stopping you from seeing the surgery but if you pop your head around the (laughs) watch the surgery I can't believe you did that that's so funny my mum watched my surgery at from the front because she's a nurse so she went and she actually watched it up front and uh, even she said it was weird with it being you so like my mum has literally seen all of my insides (laughs) And it's really bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I, 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 I was just curious, I think, more than anything. You know, because I saw them pulling hard. Like they were, yeah. I, mean, I know they do. Yeah. Pulling. For, I was thinking, what are they doing? And then, uh, you know, yeah, you just see them in the womb and stuff. And then, I, I mean, I, you, you didn't take the placenta home, did you? Or did you? No, no. Did you see it, though? 
Yeah. It's weird that is, you know. Like no, she had it in she I... had it in a bag, she went, Do you want it? I'm like, no. After my uh, natural delivery, um, it got to the stage where it took like ages for the placenta to come out, over an hour. They'd given me the injection and everything. So again, consultant popped his head around the door, scared the placenta out. But that was the point where my husband had gone down to get the bag from the car because it was just the way it was. I, we thought we were going to have the baby really quickly because I was in agony. And then, um, so he had disappeared when that happened. And actually it was a good thing because I really don't think it would. It's like, oh, that's really, it's a very odd thing, a placenta. Um, and it was quite funny around that time. There were lots of TV shows about eating your placenta and doing placenta yeah. capsules and doing like placenta prints and stuff. Yeah, no, that's, that wasn't my thing. Um, I do know people that I think have buried placentas um, and stuff, but uh yeah, it's it is a magic thing, but um, yeah, is. and each to their own. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't you didn't fry up the placenta then, Luke? No, I I just had no inkling of even wanting to go anywhere near it, especially when I saw it. I was like, but then again, I was like thinking that was actually feeding. You know, Remy, that's that's insane. It is amazing that we can build an organ like yeah. a totally separate thing inside our body that keeps another thing alive that we then don't need anymore and you just kind of get rid of it. And it's, it's like, Oh, that that's weird. Yeah. It's definitely, um, it's just a shock to the system. I think the other thing I I feel watching one born every minute as well, but, um, the aftermath of it all, and particularly with the cesarean, there's actually a lot more bleeding than you would imagine. Yes. So, and having, I was saying it would be quite hard to do, as a process with somebody you're not really um and people do this all the time that you're not really really connected to because there's a lot of stuff as a husband or a partner or whoever that you then see of your partner you you can't really avoid seeing all the bleeding and all the like no. you're seeing your partner in a completely different way and i often think it's really interesting for some of the dads who aren't you know maybe you got pregnant really quickly after you met and and it is a short space of time. Maybe you don't have that relationship where you can talk to each other. And I thought, gosh, that must have been that must be really hard for some people who don't have those supportive people there to deal with those really difficult moments. Yeah. No. No. I think support is everything, isn't it? You know, just talk. I mean, it's it's evolved around this whole conversation, really, hasn't it? Like support, you know, communication, being able to be open and honest about everything. I think. And again, even now that we are obviously a month into parenthood, we've had literally the best family support. And like even just this weekend, you know, me and Abby are having a child free date night together. And then we're going to Tattershall for a couple of nights. Obviously, that is with Remy, but we're going out with my sister and her two, my nieces this weekend. So it's it's nice to be able to have that time on our own because we haven't obviously had it yet. You know, we've all been lives evolved around Remy, which I know that is what it's all about. But we've said that it's important that we like even, for example, after after this podcast today, you know, we've got a bit of work to do. But we're going to go to a coffee shop. We're going to get out of the house and we're just going to sit there and do some work and just spend some time together. But Remy's gone to, you know, her mama's and stuff. So it's just stuff like that. It's nice to have a little bit of that throughout the week as well. Um, rather than, you know, being completely all the time looking after Remy, because it's a lot. It is a lot. Is there is there anything that surprised you about becoming a dad? Um, I think the biggest surprise for me, because I'm, I'm, I'd say, a good reader of people in a way. Like I've got a good judgment of how people's emotions are and body language. Newborns cry. And I mean, they cry. And I think there's been, I think the third night that we was back at home, I pretty much was in the, um, I was in Remy's room and I was changing a, a nappy. So th- this, this, this was crazy. So she'd pooed and weed and I changed the nappy. Then I started getting her other nappy on. She pooed again. So then I changed the nappy again. 
And then she started weeing as I was getting the other nappy. And because the wee was like a little fountain of water like, like coming out, it went all the way under. So I had to take all the clothes off. So you imagine baby's cold. You know, Remy's crying. She's screaming. She's like, head's going, arms are going all over the place. And I'm like, oh, and, you know, I'm trying to cuddle her, pick her up. Is she hungry? She didn't want the bottle. She was spitting it out of her mouth. So anyway, Abby comes in the room. She's like, baby, you're all right. And I'm just there holding Remy. And she's crying. I'm like, I, I, I don't know what to do. And I think for probably a good hour and a half, I was just putting on my shoulder. I was holding her. I was putting on my shoulder. I was holding her. She was just crying. And I just wanted Abby to get some sleep because I knew how tired she were from the hospital, not sleeping much. And that she had had a few, you know, she's in pain, you know, a few rough nights. So I was like, look, Luke, suck it up, take it. And I did. But I think that surprised, that surprised me the most, knowing that obviously you don't know what's going on. And people go colic. You do Google's like the worst thing ever. This is happening. This is, you know, so you just, you're in a bit of a, Thing. I had a night a bit like that and I've got teenagers <laughs> oh gosh yeah that's the surprise <laughs> it's the it is the best surprise but I think I think it's just not knowing you I know think what's up when you have when you become a parent you sort of have this idea that your child's going to be different and you're going to do things because you're a really relaxed and person that can read the room and all of that stuff so you're going to know what it is and then all of a sudden you're like oh crap yeah <laughs> I literally haven't a clue. I don't know what's going on. Um, and it is a learning process. Oh, a hundred percent. I'm I'm guessing. I mean, what was the biggest surprise for you? Um, the biggest shock for me was that I had postnatal depression because right. I had been around babies my whole life. I knew babies. And so a bit like you say, you know, I'd always been sort of, oh, well, if I had a baby, I would do this and it would be perfect. Um, so it was a real shock to me that I was miserable. Um, I had a beautiful baby. She was healthy, you know, all was good. And I felt absolutely miserable. So that was a real shock. Um, the, I get shocked every day. <laughs> I'm still shocked every day. I, so you know, you you just openly say things. I'm like, wow, that's that must be chaos. But you know, you you're obviously accustomed to it. So it's uh, yeah, um, just to how kind of individual they are. So now I've obviously got two. They're both girls, but they're like ones like this and ones like this, and that's a shock too. Because you and I know you hear that stuff, but just the difference and and the and how long it takes you to get out of the house. <laughs> you know when you used to just go oh let's go out and you'd walk out yeah. and my um ex-husband used to go oh I'm ready I'll see you in the car <laughs> and eventually I went hold on a minute I'm ready I'll see you in the car oh. <laughs> and then he was like oh shit <laughs> yeah because it wasn't that I wasn't ready I was absolutely ready but the bag wasn't ready the nappies weren't ready you know the baby there is that all the stuff wasn't ready so yeah he used to drive me nuts with that I'm I'm ready I'll see you in the car <laughs> yeah there is there is other things I mean obviously we we were saying because we're going to a caravan this weekend and obviously next to me Crib's got to come with us it's like that's got to get in the car fold that up obviously you've got the pram you, you know you've got car seat you've got this and yeah all right cars it can kind of carry that but it's just thinking of then yeah, I mean nappies, like you say to take that, you know, we we've got this. Um, I don't know whether you used it or there was anything like it at the time, but we we've got this like newbie bottle, it's called. It's it's like a white bottle. And what it does is obviously we've got a prep machine, but because obviously with it being a newborn, she's not obviously had like because it starts at four ounce, so she couldn't take on four ounce straight away. So yeah, it was just a, a bottle where you put the hot water in, you know, you put the formula in you know, a bit of Infocol if you need it, and you shake it up, and within, you press this button, and within five seconds, it cools it to temperature. Oh, see. So I, good. I breastfed mine for oh, okay. quite a long time, like 12 months and 19 months. So I didn't have any of the bottle stuff, and quite often, I, it would be a case of, oh, thank God I don't have to do all of that. I mean, I had a pretty difficult breastfeeding journey also, but that's for oh, another yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, But I... I think because of the depression, I was so focused that I was going to feed her. There was nothing that was going to stop me. 
because I think subconsciously I knew that if I wasn't breastfeeding her, I would just hand her over because I was mm. just not in a great place. Right, um, right. So I, but I quite often would go, once I got it sorted, which took a while, um, I was like, I, imagine getting up and having to actually heat stuff up and cool stuff down. And cause no, I don't think they did have that stuff back then. Um, but I do remember one night where um, I was in agony. Like my, my scar was sore, my boobs were sore. She was screaming and screaming and screaming and screaming. And my husband just went, I'm going to get some formula. And he literally went out and bought the ones in the one in a carton thing yeah, yeah. and bought like all the basics that we would need to give a formula, which she absolutely refused to take. What the hell is that? I'm not in that. Um, so yeah, I had a completely different um, journey. It, it's just, it, they're all journeys and I have no, um, the thing that I find with parents and mums is the sort of the whole story and stuff that goes around whether you bottle feed or breastfeed. Oh yeah. Really hard because mm -hmm. um, you just have to make the choices for yourself that are right at the time. And whatever you do, you're going to be criticized. So yeah. if you bottle feed, you're going to be criticized by some people. If you breastfeed, you're going to be criticized. Like I was criticized for in insisting on breastfeeding, even by my psychiatric nurse. She wow. actually said the phrase, you can't get all of the medication that you could be offered because you insist on breastfeeding. And this is an NHS that's supposed to be promoting breastfeeding. So like, I think one of the things I would say to any new parents is whatever you do, it's going to be wrong by somebody. Yes, so yes, you just yes. have to do what's right for you. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. There was that as well. I mean, I think Abby had come home sometimes in a little bit, not deflated, but frustrated, just the fact that what is it with people, you know, judging you on if you want to do this or you want to do that. I mean, it was even, I don't know, even if you obviously spoke with some nurses and stuff, they're like, are you going to breastfeed? Are you going to have the jabs? You know, you're going to have like the COVID jab, whatever, you know, they ask these questions. And if you say no, it's like, <gasps> why? You know, and it's like, well, because I choose not to, I have a choice in this. And I think obviously with Abby, you know, wanting to do the formula for Remy and stuff, it's obviously allowed, it's allowed me to be a bit more involved as well. We have a bit of a teamwork and a bit of a system going on. So, I mean, obviously for you, I guess it was, it, it's, it's hard oh, as well. Cause she burping and the other stuff. And the yeah, yeah. So it's, there's always jobs to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. there are. And I think that, um, what I find a shame is that men always feel they have, cause Matt said the same thing to me is that they have to justify the bottle feeding by saying it means I can have time almost as because yeah. society doesn't like it. I, well, society yeah. doesn't like either. Society doesn't want you to breastfeed in public, which I did yeah. all the time. And I didn't, yeah. it was, woe betide anybody that said anything to me and society doesn't want you to bottle feed. So what the bloody hell are you supposed to do? Mm. And, and this is the point. And it, it's, it's about, and also I think um, for women, we that question of do you want to breastfeed is a really important question because I was yeah. struggling for three weeks and after three weeks the midwife said oh there's a support group do you want the number uh, yes but they were so reluctant to say those things or put and because this the woman that they put me in touch with was what they deemed to be a bit woo and a bit wacky and a bit kind of out there but she saved me like yeah, she yeah. really did. And so even from, we've got two points of view here and e each point of view has its own battles and it's just ridiculous. We need to, women need to not have to feel so bad about choosing to bottle feed that they feel attacked by being asked the question about breastfeeding because mm -hmm. that's what's happened. It's because they feel like they're being attacked for their choice that yeah, they yeah. then get defensive about the, very legitimate question but then there's loads of women in the breastfeeding group um who would come in and say oh they want me to put them on formula and they say that i'm not feeding my baby right and and i'm made to feel bad for choosing to breastfeed it is it's one of it's something i'm really passionate about as you can tell but yep, we yeah. need to stop with both sides because both sides are getting attacked for different reasons and it's ridiculous we can't be doing that to parents and new mums and and anybody no and i think especially 
because it's going to be a massive change. I mean, there's been times already, like just even from my side about, and I know the women get a lot at them about what, like what you just said there, breastfeeding or, or formula. It's just the fact that you are looking after somebody else as well. And your life is never going to be the same again. Nope. You know, it's so, so I think, you know, because it's such a drastic change, like obviously, you know, you're quite open about having postnatal depression, you know, again, again, for me, it's, it's been, I suppose, really what, what I really feared and it's not been too bad so far is I feared lack of sleep. Like I am somebody that is really, really energetic and I pride myself on quality of sleep being in the health world, you know, now, all right, it's deprived a little bit, but it's not as bad as I thought. And I was really kind of fearing that. And I think it's just all of this adjustment, all of these things that, you've got to think about now that, and then you've got people in your ear all, even if they've got two, three, and they just jab, 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 jab with you with all these things. It's like, we back off or at least just, you know, and and then you have some people that will just go Luke, which, you know, they're straight up talking. And I'd, I'd say the same to any new parent or any becoming parent who do what works for you. You'll, you'll soon adapt. What you'll find is that, yeah, you'll have opinions from certain people, but you will know what to do in that situation when it arises. And, you know, that advice for me, I've gone, that's practically what I've done. You know, there's been things where, yeah, I've just gone, oh, okay, I'm I'm going to do that. And then it's worked. Or, you know, I've had Remy doing this, crying her eyes out, whatever. I've tried this. It's worked. I've walked her up and down the whole way at like 2 a.m. in the morning and she's, she's dropped to sleep and it's like, Yes, you know, it's just things like that that you, you learn, don't you? have to learn. That's the you people think. don't, people want an instant answer. You've got to learn. And you've got to continuously learn. I'm still learning now, yeah, you yeah. know, going into the ADHD journey and neurodiversity and all that stuff. It's a massive learning curve. And I'm at teenage years. So there isn't, a, I don't think you ever stop learning as a parent. My parents are still learning now about us and, you know, how to be yeah. grandparents. And so I think, the fact that I love learning, it's a great thing. And so do you. Um, how do you think your perspective on future goals has changed since you became a dad? So this is, I'm going to, I'm going to go against what most people would say. Right. And this is me being real because I get it where guys will say, now that I have a family, I'm going to prioritize my family. Right. As in, I'm doing it for my kids. Like, so in, in my world of fitness and health and people who take care of themselves, they'll go, but I want to, you know, I, I want to be there to see my kids grow up. I want to be able to play with them and all that kind of stuff. I, I just think that is pretty, it's just like robotic talk. It's what people generally say. It, you, you can't have a child that comes into your life to suddenly make you change that you need to start taking care of yourself. So I think for me, it's like, all right, the, the biggest thing for me is obviously what's changed is the fact that I want to continue having freedom with what I'm doing with life, but I also want to be present and ensure that I am part of every stage of Remy's life, right? So I I don't want to fall. Like My biggest thing now since being, becoming a dad is like I am like, I want to play with Remy. I want Remy to learn. I want I want to have daddy time. So it's just like just me and Remy. Like we've gone out on walks on our own. Abby does the same thing. It's like I want to put myself in all these scenarios. And like even even the other day, I was out walking Remy. I had people pipping me. I had women looking at me like, like, are you actually taking it's you and your daughter out at say one o'clock in the afternoon with a pram, walking your yeah, that's me go daddy you know kind of thing because because normally in the day you just see like probably mums pushing prams everywhere you know and I'm like I want to go against the trend like yes go you know my my cousin's a stay-at-home dad um and he always found it really hard like going into baby groups and all of that kind of stuff was just it's really difficult for men and they've got to be very brave to put themselves in those positions and it is not easy and it's also not fair because we should be in a society that easily accepts that. And we're still not there yet. It's like no. you're encroaching on the, on the space. 
And I'm thinking about this actually in the whole conversation. I think um, that new dads would be a great space for your master your life program. Actually, I don't know even if you've even thought of that as a thing, but actually this is when I think dads do lose themselves quite a lot and they do get embroiled and they have to be financially stable, have to be financially this. It's all about going to work, providing, providing, providing. And that is when they lose themselves. And when they lose themselves, that's when they lose focus on the family actually and end up not um, being present and being yeah. in a nice space when they get home. And it's difficult when they get home. And uh, so I think that's a really good space for for new dads to actually spend time for themselves with themselves because if yeah. I'm like I'm like you I think that if we don't look after ourselves as parents our kids suffer 10 times more yeah I, I agree and the thing is is we know this as kids when they're younger as well they they may not hear and understand what you're saying but they see yeah so because they see the environment they see your actions they, if they if they say it about babies right if they if I, I've heard this, I don't know how true it is, but like, say you're tired and they're crying and they see that you're stressed, that you're stressed in your face that because they're crying, you're like, oh, no, I don't know what to do. It makes them cry more. Like, they, they, yeah. they, they, so, so it's about being calm. It's about them knowing that, oh my God, you know, I'm looking up to my dad. I'm looking up to my mom as a role model. Like, I want to be like my mom or I want to be like my dad in, in regards to looking after myself. I don't have to become a, I don't know, a fitness person or, or an engineer or something. It's just about them. Yeah, I want that. You know, I want, I want, I just want Remy to look up to me and go, do you know what? My dad's always had those values. He's always had those standards and he's, he's really always been there for me when I've needed him the most. Cause I think that's where there's a lot of dads and, and I'm talking to guys now where, you know, I talk to business owners and stuff like that, that, yeah, all right. We all want financial freedom. Everybody wants more money in the bank. Everybody wants the next thing, right? Because there's so much things out there that we want to do and want to buy. However, what you've got to do sometimes is slow down a little bit and actually enjoy the journey. Yeah. Enjoy it and just be present. And I think that's where it, that's that. Yeah. So the master your life element side of things, it's that's the reason why now I want it to be around slowing down and creating a fun life outside of work, whether that is daddy time with, you know, your daughter or having yeah quality time and just doing something different it just and your program like your program does include financial stuff too you know it, yeah it yeah, yeah, have yeah. That element in it yeah. which i think is amazing lots of programs don't include that is how you manage your finances how you create better finances and all of that kind of stuff where you where you can um invest better for for a better future for you and your kids or whoever else is is important to you well, we have managed to fill the hour pretty well, Luke. Um, but I do want to ask you a final question. Um, it's been one I've been asking all of my guests. And the question is, and I think I would like to also know what if your perception of this has changed recently. Um, what is love? What is love? Do you know, for, for many years, I didn't know what love was. As in, I, I didn't know if I felt in love with something. I just feel no matter. Like love to me is if you're dist like in, in anything distressed emotionally, you're fed up or anything like that, that you'll always take actions towards displaying your love for somebody. So if I just to give an example, me and Abby was going through a rough time because I think an example might be a little bit better just in terms of that because I know people can take it different ways. Really tough time. Nobody told me to do it. I just went out my way after the gym, dropped off at the florist, picked up some uh, favorite flowers and just dropped them off and I said, babe, I appreciate you. I love you. And these are for you. You're doing an amazing job. You're going to be a great mother. Da -da -da -da. She, she was shocked. So, oh my God, Bobby, thanks so much. You know, she's, that to me is when you know that you love somebody. It's just, just a simple, th like an action step like that, I feel. Okay. So that's really interesting. I love that. Did your feeling of love change when the baby was born um did did you get because I again I think this is just that story that we're told that oh you see the baby and this love just comes rushing in but I know lots of people that said no it wasn't like that for me so did you have that was it different yeah I think obviously 
you know, I, I love Abby more as a result of being able to create that inside of her and then Remy coming out as well. Obviously, I've got so much love for her. Um, I think there'll be more love coming once I feel there's a bit more like sass, a bit more character and, you know, like giving something back, like maybe saying something back to me. I think there'll be more love in that side. But um, yeah, there's, there's been definitely more love since the birth of, of Remy, yeah. And I think that's a good point as well, because love grows and it expands and you don't have to feel that all encompassing rush that, that everybody sort of talks about. That's not the way it is for everybody. That's just the nice romantic story that people like to put forward about the birth of a child. But the reality can be that actually it can take weeks, months, years sometimes mm -hmm. to get to know your child and develop that that love that you hear about and that's okay it's not a problem if you don't feel that immediate and I think there's a lot of pressure particularly on men to have that uh, straight away and, and then they go well what's wrong with me yeah. why do I feel that yeah no I, I it's true I mean I've spoken with dads that have have openly said you know Luke it had taken me probably six months for me to to love my, my child just purely because they didn't probably spend as much time as they would have liked because they was doing the groundhog work. And then at the same time, all they ever come home to what they said was just crying, <laughs> pooing and weeing, like they pooed on me, they weed on me, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was like, I weren't, I don't know. I, I, how could I, like, like, not to be in a horror, how could I love that, you know, at that time. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for joining me today. It's been a great conversation. I think it's added value. Have you got any last thing that you would like to say to the listeners today to help them? I don't really think, I, th I feel like we've covered a lot, um, yeah. but, but I think just simply just be real, be honest, be your authentic self and whatever kind of comes to you, don't seek approval, just go for it, just do it and si see what happens. I'm really glad that we did this on uh, video record today. So um, hopefully it's all worked all right. Um, so Thank you for joining me on my first ever video recorded one. Thanks, Woo. listeners. And uh, yeah, I know. And remember, listeners, as I always say, remember to have a powerful day, whatever having a powerful day means to you.